Namaskaram and good evening everyone to week two of Kerala Architecture Festival, commonly known as PACES, a festival of culture, politics and design modeled after Kerala Literature Festival. I am Professor Michi Matthew, Principal, DC School of Architecture and Design, Trivandrum, and will be co-hosting this event tonight. Kerala Architecture Festival is an event promoted by DZ Karakemuri Foundation, DZ Schools of Architecture and Design, both Trivandrum and Wagaman campuses, along with DZ Books on similar lines of Kerala Literature Festival, one of India's largest literature events. Today, we are putting the spotlight on the capital city of Trivandrum, life around the temple and urban form of Trivandrum Fort. Our distinguished speakers for the day are architect Sharad Sundar and Dr. Bina Paragan. As we all know, the city of Tiruvannathapuram translates to the city of Lord Ananda, referring to the principal deity of the Padmanabhat Swami temple who is enshrined in the Ananda Shayana poster. Both our speakers for the evening, architect Sharad Sundar and Dr. Bina Karagan, has carried out immense research around this temple and the fort area surrounding it. They have also been organizing heritage walks in this area regularly. Architect Sharad Sundar has done his Bachelor of Architecture from College of Engineering, Trivandrum, and later his post-graduation in conservation from School of Planning and Architecture, Delhi. He is also the author of The King's Craftsman, a book which documents the history of the extinct craft of ivory carving in Kerala. He regularly contributes articles for the Hindu on history, art, architectural and cultural heritage. Architect Sh Sharad Sundar is a member of the Conservation Committee constituted by the Honorable Supreme Court of India for the Sri Patmanabha Swami Temple in 2017. He is currently working as a faculty in College of Engineering, Trivandrum. Welcome, Architect Sharad Sundar, to the 2021 online edition of Kerala Architecture Festival. Our next speaker, Dr. Bina Thomas Paragan, is an archaeologist and a heritage consultant. Based in Trivandrum since the past 10 years, she is the founder coordinator of the Heritage Walk Trivandrum. Voluntary initiative started in 2013. Previously, she was a special officer for the Government of Kerala's UNESCO World Heritage Listing Project. She holds a PhD from the Deccan College, University of Pune in archaeology. She has taught and has been part of several public awareness and outreach programs on history and heritage in her previous home-based cities in India and abroad. She has maintained columns on history and heritage in Deccan Chronicle, Deccan Herald, as well as the Hindu, and is a published author for young adults. Welcome, distinguished speaker, Dr. Bina Karagi. We appreciate all viewers who are present online and kindly request you to send their, your requests in the comment box. Without further delay, let's welcome both speakers, Dr. Bina Paragan, as well as architect Sharad Sundar, to exchange and express views on the city of Tiruvananthapuram, life around the temple and the urban form of the city. Over to you, Dr. Bina. Good evening. Thank you, Miji. Good evening, friends. Uh, and thanks to the, all the organizing organizers and the team for this opportunity. Uh, today's topic, Life Around the Temple, Urban Forms of Trivandrum Fort, is of uh, special interest uh, to me as an archaeologist because history becomes interesting and relevant when it is understood as a dynamic, ongoing process, especially so when we try to understand how small uh, hamlets become villages and subsequently into towns and capital cities. Uh, not all hamlets uh, grow to become important uh, areas of land, uh, trade centers, or uh, educational hub, uh, or into capital cities. But in the case of Trivandrum, or uh, Tiruvannandapuram, as uh, we like to call it, this change from a small settlement around the magnificent 
Sri Padmanabha Swami Temple to a fortified capital city of the Travancore Maharajas happened less than 300 years ago in the later half of the 18th century. It was a very significant move to shift the capital from Padmanabhapura at a distance of 50 kilometers in Takale district of Tamil Nadu to this temple town, maybe perhaps even not a town, a small village surrounding the temple. Besides the purpose of such a move, which no doubt was of strategic uh, reasons, it would be interesting to look at the changes this form of urbanization brought about in this small uh, village of uh, 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 Trivandrum, which at that point, I mean, there are several historical records to tell us about what uh, this small hamlet or the small village around the temple was like. And uh, I think well, Sharad, who has uh, done a lot of research in this area and is pretty much an expert in this area, what do you think, Sharad, was the reason why this uh, capital was shifted? You know, why did they have to? I'm sure there would have been strategic reasons, definitely, as a kingdom, there must have been strategic. But other than that, uh, what were the reasons why this particular locality was chosen? Okay. First of all, thanks to Spaces Kerala Architecture Festival for providing a platform to discuss the history of Tiruvannathapuram. Now, um, regarding the question why the capital was shifted, uh, there is still a debate going amongst historians on the exact time in which the capital was shifted. Some people say that Martha Davarma, uh, who is uh, the father of modern Travancore kingdom, uh, uh, after uh, he consolidated the kingdom and established Travancore from the old Venard kingdom, uh, had uh, offered his lands to Padmanabha Swami at uh, the Padmanabha Swami temple that is known as Tripadidana, and following which uh, the capital was shifted to Tiruvannathapuram. But that is not the case because if you look at the early history of uh, the rulers of Travancore, uh, their predecessors were known as the rulers of Venard Kingdom. That was a small kingdom uh, that is uh, roughly placed in southern uh, part of Kerala, uh, covering uh, certain regions in, uh, from the Kanyakumari district, uh, Trivandrum district, and going up to Kola. So what happened was that uh, if you look at uh, the uh, distribution of power, then uh, the uh, Elayaraja are the next in line to the throne, uh, who uh, will be the younger brother or a nephew of the uh, Chirava Mupan. He was known as the Tripapur Mupan. And then there was the matriarch of uh, the royal family, we're not royal family. So these three people were very important uh, and they often lived in different places. So the Churava movement uh, in most cases resided at Kolla because that was the capital of the Venard kingdom. So, so the main palaces and the administrative uh, structures and those things were formed in Kolla. But what was happening in southern part of Venard Kingdom is very interesting and important for our discussion because the southern section was uh, handed over to uh, this Tripapur movement. So he was the one who actually looked after uh, the important temples and the palaces in the south. So Patmanabhuram um, and some places near Patmanabhuram like Keralapuram uh, 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 were very, very important strategic locations for the Venard rulers because they were uh, in charge of a very fertile land that was known as Nanjinad. And almost all the superpowers uh, in the south, like Cholas and the Pandyas, uh, they were always fighting for this fertile land. And therefore, it was crucial for the Venard rulers to establish palaces and forts near Nanjinad and to check invasion, to check on invasions. So, so uh, this Tripapur movement was often placed there in the south. 
uh, he maintained his army there and that is why if you look at old records of Padmanabhapuram palace it is known as Pada Veda. Pada means army, uh, a place where you have your garrison or army uh, is stationed. So uh, that was the status of Padmanabhapuram. But gradually um, uh, Trivandrum uh, arose in prominence. That there are many reasons why Trivandrum rose in prominence. One of the reasons, of course, is the presence of the temple. The temple is very old. We have references from 8th century CE, at least, uh, stating the uh, presence of a very strong Vaishnavite uh, uh, temple uh, in, in Tiruvannadapura. So the temple was, of course, famous. And then uh, when the temple grew in stature, uh, there was a need to focus uh, on Tiruvannadapuram. And if you look at the political situation also, the southern sections of Vernad Kingdom were uh, comparatively enjoying a, a relatively a peaceful disposition during 18th century. So uh, the rulers actually uh, turned to the and one, one more 18th century, if you look at um, Vernard Kingdom, you have the, the Chirava movement residing at Kolla, then you have the Matriarch residing at Attingal, and then you have the Tripapur movement residing in the southern province, that is Patmanavapuram and Keralapuram uh, and Iranian palaces and all came under Tripapur movement. With respect to all these places, Tiruvannandapuram is a strategic location because if you see the map of Kerala or Tiruvannandapuram and Kollam and mark all these palaces, you will see that it is centrally placed. So it was essential that uh, the rulers should concentrate more on this particular place so that they, 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 they were able to control all the other sections, all the other places in the, in the kingdom. But of course, uh, the uh, change or the shift in capital happened um, after Martha and Avarma. Uh, generally shifted the capital from Patmanavapuram to Tiruvannadapuram. That is wrong because uh, uh, Martha when he uh, uh, started the reconstruction of Patmanabhaswami temple and the construction of the fort walls in Tiruvannadapuram and he also reconstructed several minor temples and palaces in Tiruvannadapuram. But at the same time, he reconstructed Patmanabhapuram and, uh, uh, and the palace there. The Padmanabhapuram four walls were strengthened and reconstructed using stone. And in fact, if you look at later records also, there are many interesting records from the time of Dharmaraja, who was the successor of Martha and Avarma. He usually resided at Padmanabhapuram Palace. We have accounts of uh, um, foreign uh, dignitaries visiting the Maharaja at Padmanabhapuram Palace. So uh, Padmanabhapuram was very important. Uh, during the time of uh, also. Hello. Is there a network problem? But later on, what happened was yeah. uh, Okay, is it audible? Yes, it, yeah, it works. Yeah, it is yeah, audible. There is a slight yeah. connectivity issue, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so later on, it was only after Dharmaraja's period that the capital was actually shifted to Tiruvannadapuram. It was a gradual process. Uh, it happened slowly, and it was only during the time of Avatam Dirunal Balarama Verma, successor of uh, uh, Dharmaraja, that uh, the shift uh, took place completely. Mm. So, um, as I always say, like Rome was not built in a day. Similarly, I mean, no capital city can be fix a date to say, you know, I mean, I feel, you know, fixing a date to this was the date when the capital was shifted is quite not the right way to see it. So it was a gradual process, as you said. But when the planning happened, I'm sure a lot of planning must have happened as to how exactly uh, this small temple town should now function as a capital city. So there must have been a lot of planning that went behind it. 
So we must be having a lot of records also which talk or discuss about these matters also, right? Yes. Yes. In fact, we are fortunate to have uh, several records on uh, this Tapati who actually designed or restructured the old settlement pattern in Tiruvannathapuram and also in Padmanabhapuram. Uh, his name is Keshavan Vishnu Tradhan Nambudiri. Uh, he was a Vastu expert and a Stapati. So uh, we see that uh, when Martha Verma became uh, the king of Travancore uh, in 1728, just after that he starts or he commissions um, a, a massive reconstruction activity in Tiruvannathapuram. So he calls uh, this Stapati, uh, Keshavan Vishnu Tradhan, and he is asked to redesign Tiruvannathapuram, which if you ask uh, an architect uh, is a nightmare for an architect. That, uh, such a project will be a nightmare for an architect because Tiruvannathapuram, as you know, is a very old settlement, and we we have uh, what uh, records of scattered settlements, not very dense settlements, but scattered settlements around the temple from. As early as 13th century, we have we have uh, uh, a lot of records of many madhams, uh, uh, a few palaces, and houses of various tenants of the temple lands uh, residing around uh, Padmanabha Swami Temple. But of course, the fourth wall was not there. There was only a, a wall that surrounded the temple. Therefore, the temple, Padmanabha Swami temple was also known as Madhilagam. And it was actually a Sanketam. Sanketam means it was a temple state because uh, it was very powerful and the temple itself was controlled by a council that is known as Etra Yoga. And therefore, if you look uh, uh, all across Kerala, you will, you will find several Madhilagams, temples known as Madhilagams. And these Madhilagams are all uh, great temple. So Patmanabha, uh, Patmanabha Swami temple was of course a great temple, a Madhilagam, a Sanketam. So there were um, settlements scattered around, there were other activities going on, there were processional routes associated with the temple. And when Keshav and Vishnu Tradhan came to take over the project, uh, his client is the Maharaja and that to a very powerful uh, uh, Maharaja. Uh, and he was asked to restructure the settlement and to uh, construct, design and construct a fort um, uh, to, to uh, what, try to, uh, and bring in all the settlements, the major, major houses and major institutions inside the fort walls. So that was not, not at all an easy task because uh, he had two projects. He had to work um, in Tiruvannandapuram. Uh, he had to redesign the temple, reconstruct the ancient Padmanabha Swami temple and design the fort walls, the processional routes, etc. And then at the same time, he was also involved in the redesign of Padmanabha Buram palace and the settlements surrounding it. So just like what he did in Tiruvannandapuram, he, he made a design for the old settlement. He restructured the old settlement uh, in Padmanabhapuram too. So it is very interesting because his process towards this project is, is very, very interesting. Uh, because as I mentioned, he was a Vastu expert. Uh, he, of course, uh, knew all the Vastu texts and um, uh, and the uh, rules set out in Vastu and all those things. Uh, but his main challenge was to keep the temple as the core in Tiruvannandapura. The Patmanabha Swami temple as the core. And uh, uh, while he restructured the settlement, he was not allowed to touch or replace certain buildings. Like there were many important, uh, very ancient temples scattered around Padmanabha Swami temple. There were madams, there were some palaces also. So there were a lot of restrictions also. So his process is in fact very interesting. His process towards this project is very interesting uh, because uh, while he restructured uh, uh, the entire settlement, constructed the fort wall, the fort walls, um, uh, uh, the fort area is 55 uh, hectares and uh, it is 900 square meters 
so inside you have a uh, whole lot of settlements belonging to various communities they they were given uh, the sectorization was done according to their uh, social status but what about uh, the prime property that is the place where you construct the temples uh, it is very interesting uh, see uh, in manishyale chandriga it is mentioned that the apt place to construct a uh, residence uh, can be determined by many factors and one of the determining factor is the presence of a temple and if you compare patmanabhapuram and tiruvananthapuram the plan and the scale of the project is almost similar but the basic idea applied or the concept behind these two projects are entirely different because in tiruvananthapuram you have a temple dedicated to a shanta murti that is patmanabha swami he is a shanta murti so manishyalaya chandrika says that if you have a shanta murti then the apt place to construct a residence is on the right hand side of the shanta murti and that to in front of him okay but if you look here in tiruvananthapuram if you look at a map of tiruvananthapuram fort area you will see that that principle is followed here you have the palace complex the valiya kottaram complex consisting of uh, kudra maliga uh, that is the palace uh, constructed by swadhi tirunal ananda vilasam krishna vilasam uh, and various other very uh, old palaces uh, uh, located on the south east side of patmanabha swami temple and now south east side of patmanabha swami temple if you see the deity that is on his right hand side and in front of him but the design is uh, on the uh, what it is extremely different uh, uh, procedure that he followed in patmanabha pura because uh, people often go to patmanabha pura and see patmanabha pura palace and they think that patmanabha pura palace is the core of the settlement but palace is not the core of the settlement there actually uh, the core of the settlement there is a very ancient temple by the name neelakanta swami temple a shiva temple and patmanabha puram palace here in tiruvananthapuram uh, patmanabha swami temple faces east and the palaces main main palaces face east or uh, the uh, southern direction but uh, when you look at patmanabha puram the palace faces west and the main entry to the fort is on the western side but the core as i mentioned is a shiva temple and shiva is a ugra murti just opposite of what you have in tiruvananthapuram so manishyalaya chandrika again states that if you have an uh, ugra murti then the apt place to construct your house is on the rear side of the ugra murti on his left hand side now if you look at the map of patmanabhapuram that is the exact located uh, place where keshavan vishnu tratan uh, has restructured the old uh, of course the palaces were there few buildings were there but martha davarma's reconstruction project enlarged that palace complex and all those things uh, you see on the rear side of neelakanta swami temple on the left hand side of uh, the deity there so these are very interesting things that you uh, so some of the details you will get to uh, see in the madhulagam records madhulagam records um, are the records uh, very detailed records or a day to day accounts uh, pertaining to uh, the madhulagam that is patmanabha swami temple we have records from 13th century ce so those records hold valuable information regarding Uh, construction and uh, how uh, uh, the construction proceeded and what all structures were constructed now uh, th this was an interesting thing that i wanted to share yeah this is very interesting because uh, we go into the intricacies of how uh, the details you know the vastu details which they followed and you know uh, which was very clearly indicated in the records and they tried all which was very specifically charted out everywhere but simultaneously this is an interesting time 
in Kerala, uh, especially with all the Western influences, which were uh, making, uh, they've started making inroads uh, many, many centuries ago. But then this was a time when these Western influences were very prevalent in other areas for say instance in um, Kollam near Kollam um, Tangasheri near Kollam these uh, influences were very uh, prevalent so how did at this juncture in the later half of the 18th century as we are talking uh, how were these western influences seen and how were they uh, you know in whether they were incorporated at all uh, or uh, you know they were kept out uh, beyond the fort walls, you know, how was it? Uh, that's a very interesting question because if you see what happened in Tiruvannandapuram, as I mentioned, Tiruvannandapuram was actually a temple town, and the population, if you see here, uh, where uh, 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 the very orthodox uh, uh, a Brahmin population and people who were mostly working for the temple and tenants of the temple properties and all. So it was an orthodox kind of settlement that uh, did not actually uh, happily embrace all those Western elements coming in during that uh, uh, point. But um, if you look at, uh, at Patmanabhapura, the Patmanabhuviram Palace complex is seen as uh, a very good specimen of um, uh, traditional Kerala architecture and that too, the timber architecture that was very, very unique to southern part of Kerala. You get to see wonderful creations there in Patmanabhuviram. And now, uh, if you are familiar with the palace complex, you when you when you visit the palace complex, almost all the structures that you see there at first are traditional structures. But when you walk in, and if you look carefully, you will see some kind of Western elements being used or incorporated into these buildings. For example, the oldest structure in Patmanabhapuram Palace complex is, of course, the Thai Kotara. Thai Kotaram is the mother structure, that means that was the core structure or this very first structure that was uh, ever erected in that complex. And all the other structures uh, were added on at a later period. Uh, we are fortunate to have that core structure, the Thai Kotaram, which is a, a double storied uh, a structure with a courtyard in the center. But when you uh, when you climb the stairs and see uh, the first floor, you will be uh, surprised to see a mother of pearls being used in the shutters there. And that is actually wonderful because you in some sections you have the very old uh, pan uh, window panes with mother of pearl shutters. This is a uh, influence from the West. So, so likewise, if you walk towards the uh, eastern side of the palace complex, uh, you have a mansion that which is known as Indra Vilasa. So, the scale of all the buildings, majority of the buildings in Patmanabhapuram Palace complex, you you see the traditional Kerala kind of spaces. Uh, the windows are small, ceiling heights. Are, uh, uh, are very much lower when compared to modern constructions. Uh, uh, the door sizes are much smaller than the standard sizes we are used to in these days. But when you walk through a, a gallery uh, connecting the palace complex and when you enter into this particular structure that is known as Indra Vilasam, the scale changes, the uh, building materials uh, used for the construction changes and even you, you will see uh, and, uh, large windows um, there and balconies and elements that you will see in colonial structures being incorporated in that structure. So the history of that structure is also interesting. It is said that uh, uh, Indra Vilasam was constructed during the reign of Martha Varma and uh, Martha Varma's trusted minister Ramayan Dalava was the one who supervised the construction. Uh, but for all the uh, uh, orthodoxy associated with these uh, places, the palace complex, this structure is unique because it was a guest house and it was constructed by the Maharajas to uh, accommodate uh, for, uh, dignitaries who uh, who came uh, to uh, Patmanabhapuram Palace. So, likewise, uh, likewise in, uh, in in the fortified in the fort 
complex yes. of Van Rim, do we have uh, structures which incorporate uh, colonial elements within the fort yes. complex? Yes, actually, actually, uh, uh, if you look at Patmanabhaguram, the construction of Indra Vilasam uh, 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 happened sometime during uh, 18th century, late 18th century. But when it comes to Thiruvananthapuram, Thiruvananthapuram was not so keen to embrace all, Thiruvan, uh, uh, not Thiruvananthapuram, the fort area was not mm. very keen to embrace Western elements. So we uh, have buildings constructed during 18th century, late 18th century by Dharma Raja uh, and even by Martha Verma uh, in pure traditional style. And uh, in many cases, we see little bit of European influence coming in, but that is not very much evident in those constructions. But everything changes uh, during early 19th century. So we, we have to, uh, if you look at the larger context, uh, I hope all of you know about uh, uh, the Kundra uh, proclamation and uh, the revolt uh, that happened in, Tra uh, uh, in Travancore against the British uh, and Venitam Vidalava, the Divan of uh, Travancore uh, Rajas were uh, uh, the uh, uh, instigator of this revolt. And what happened after that was uh, of course, uh, Venitambi uh, uh, had to flee Thiruvananthapuram and British gained an upper hand after the revolt. And uh, they um, actually shifted um, uh, 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 their cantonment to Thiruvananthapuram. They established a cantonment here in Thiruvananthapuram, which we now know as Palayam. That place is known as Palayam. So after uh, this uh, direct association with a uh, uh, Western power, we see that the rulers, the later rulers also were very keen to embrace uh, Western uh, uh, what traditions and uh, with regard to architecture, the Western tastes in architecture also crept in and it became very much popular with the elite uh, classes. So uh, actually it is very interesting because we have records uh, uh, from Dharma Raja's period, that is late 18th century, of uh, European dignitaries um, uh, presenting the Maharaja with oil paintings and art prints, uh, and all these things came from Europe. And uh, the Maharaja had all these things framed, and he put all these things in the palace collection. But uh, influence on architecture was minimal. But when it comes to uh, the reign of the Maharani. Uh, that is uh, Maharani Lakshmi Bai, Swadhi Tirunal's mother, and later on we see that many um, colonial, uh, many structures influenced by uh, the colonial architecture style were constructed inside the fort area. And of course, we have a record uh, which states that one uh, the Mahar Maharani uh, calls in a European engineer by the name Grant. And uh, he is asked to design some buildings within the fort area for the personal use of the Maharani. Uh, so, so those structures, some of the structures are still there. Uh, so the first uh, structure with evident European features to come up inside fort area was the Malika of Sri Padam Palace Complex, a double storied mm -hmm. structure. Um, uh, with a lot of U European uh, features on the facade. I think the and, structure, uh, it, I think the, structure uh, the core structure of this uh, palace was old, but I think the front area was what was yes. later added on as yes. in the colonial elements, right? Yes. In fact, Sri Padam Palace is one of the oldest palaces uh, in the fort area because we have records from 14th century CE. Uh, uh, pointing to the existence of Sri Padam Palace. Uh, that, of course, is a small palace. It was a, 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 a palace with a courtyard in the center, a small structure. But uh, the Maharani added this double storied uh, uh, Malika in front of it, a mansion in front of it. So that was uh, the first uh, um, uh, building with evident colonial features to come up inside the fort area and it is located uh, on the northern side of Padmanabha Swami temple, the northern, near the northern Gopuram of Padmanabha Swami temple and on the other side, on the southern side of the uh, 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 temple also she constructed another palace which is now known as the uh, Kuri Banglava or Kuri Malika 
uh, that is also a, a, a structure that was used by the Baharani and you see very evident um, European elements and even the scale of the building and uh, the ceiling height and um, the size of the openings uh, and louvers, uh, windows and doors with louvers also came in during that point of time in Travancore. So, so uh, every, uh, we can say that uh, from the early uh, 19th century is when we start seeing, uh, maybe can we call it a second phase of urbanization of modern, uh, modern Trivandrum? wherein the yes, city yes, spins beyond the fortified area, where the city grows beyond the fortified area. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. Because what happens after 19th century is that, see, the fort, when it was designed by Keshav and Vishnu Tratan in a um, uh, later part of 18th century, uh, the size of the uh, settlements were much smaller. But when the capital was shifted, a lot of people uh, came to Tiruvannadapuram and they uh, constructed houses uh, inside the fort area uh, and around the fort area. And gradually, uh, during Swadhi Tirunal's time, we see that the administrative core was shifted from Kollam to Tiruvannadapuram and that to inside the fort area. And the fort area uh, did not have uh, that much of open spaces. So uh, by uh, say 1850s there was dire need to move out of fort area there was no space inside uh, the uh, fort walls uh, so uh, therefore if we look at the trend of urbanization that started uh, from early 19th century onwards we see evident uh, 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 what uh, the constructions or tangents from mid 19th century and uh, we see the Huzur Kacheri, that is the secretariat structure uh, that uh, was constructed in 1860s, uh, being moved uh, uh, from the interior of the fort and transferred uh, to a, a higher terrain outside the fort walls. But even before that, uh, Swadhi Tirunal's younger brother, Uttram Tirunal Martanda Verma, uh, he actually uh, shifted some of the offices uh, to outside the fort and uh, in fact that uh, that structure which was known as the Ana Kacheri was lo located in a uh, plot uh, just next to the uh, secretary building but that structure is not there. Anyway. Also uh, many of the officials the British officials also set up their beautiful bungalows right we have like for mm -hmm. instance the Barton Hill the bungalow at the Barton Hill or the women's college, which was also part of a residence of a, a British physician. So all these, as the city expands, you know, uh, a lot of uh, infrastructural work also, as in roads were needed, wherein they had to be connected to the fort area also, or was it completely cut away from the fort area? Okay, if you look at uh, Tiruvannadapuram, not the fort area, if you look at Tiruvannadapuram and the trends of urbanization in Tiruvannadapuram, in a historical perspective, you will uh, see that Tiruvannadapuram has got a, 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 what the Britishers call the native core, uh, that is uh, a Padmanabha Swami temple and the uh, fort wall surrounding it, and you have uh, uh, densely packed agraharams and all those things. And uh, if you look at uh, that settlement, you see on the eastern side, there is Chala Bazaar, which is still there. Uh, and uh, it is very much part of the old settlement pattern. And on the western side, there is this Arat route, which connects to uh, Shangamukham um, uh, Palace and the Shangamukham Beach. So that was the native core for the um, uh, British officials. So what happened was that um, after uh, 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 what uh, early 19th century after the Kundra proclamation and the revolt and all those things I mentioned that the cantonment was established in Palaya and uh, therefore the European settlers uh, when they when they came to Tiruvannadapuram they established uh, their settlements around cantonment area so if you look at the cantonment act of 
1850s, it is clearly mentioned that this is not applicable only in Tiruvannandapuram or in South India. It was ap applicable throughout the country for uh, establishing cantonments and settlements uh, associated with cantonments. Europeans always wanted their settlements to be away, away from native core because they, they believed that most of the diseases uh, were airborne. And uh, if you live near the native core, uh, which they considered uh, uh, to be filthy places, because they, uh, the, the, there are reports which states that the drainage system and all of these things are not up to European standards. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of people stay together in dense clusters. It, is, it was not safe for the Europeans to uh, reside anywhere near these native cores. So then, it, therefore, I guess they it, worked, it, it worked both ways also, no? For the, yes, uh, yes. the traditional settlers also, they didn't want to mingle freely with yeah, them. They wanted yeah, to maintain yes. their even, purity even and distance. They did not yeah. want to interfere with, yeah. with uh, the uh, European settlements. That, that is yeah. uh, uh, actually very interesting because as I mentioned, you have a Chala Bazaar, which is a, a market for the native population. And when the Europeans came, the Maharani uh, issues order uh, to uh, establish a, a separate <laughs> market. Yes, because uh, because Chala Bazaar primarily provides commodities and goods for uh, a temples centric population. Yeah. So so uh, uh, non vegetarian things, uh, flesh, uh, fish, and all these things were not available in Chala Bazaar. But Europeans wanted all those things. So the Maharani established another uh, uh, market, which is now known as Kandemara Market in a uh, cantonment area that is Palaya. Oh. So, so uh, coming back to our point, uh, the Europeans, when they, when they established their settlements, they always wanted uh, to make the, construct their bungalows on higher terrains. Mm -hmm. But gradually what we see is that this uh, taste, uh, this particular uh, uh, thing of constructing buildings on higher terrains, on hilltops, um, uh, was uh, taken on by the rulers as well because from 1930s onwards we see Swati Tirunal constructing um, uh, palaces and hunting lodges uh, uh, on higher terrains like uh, you have Kanaga Kumna uh, and moving further uh, towards the east uh, we see Vellayambalam Kumna uh, we have Kavadiyar Kumna which is another hill then we have Tirumala Kumna and in all uh, on top of all these hills pa small palaces were constructed by the local rulers as well. So therefore, if you look at uh, the uh, urban history uh, or the history of urbanization in Tiruvannandapuram, uh, in a, a historical perspective, we see these two distinct uh, uh, kind of um, uh, settlements on the native core and the colonial core. Hmm. But uh, they did gradually as a trend also, these colonial features were quite uh, liberally adopted by the uh, ruling family and gradually even by the locals, the people, the wealthy yes. or the affluent privileged class also adopted these, isn't it? Yes, yes. Actually, when the rulers followed that particular style, then uh, first the elite uh, aristocratic clan, members of uh, aristocratic clan, they constructed, they followed the trend. And if you, uh, if you um, uh, see um, uh, the later growth of Tiruvannandapuram city, and if you if you uh, look at Vellayambalam area, you you have the Kavadiyar Kundu Palace, uh, which is the present Kavadiyar Palace. And near Kavadiyar Palace, there are many other structures like the Belhaven, the Manmohan Bangla, um, uh, and uh, and Diamond Hill. And all these structures were not uh, owned by the royal family. Diamond Hill was a mansion constructed by Divan Nanupulla, the, the uh, Divan or Prime Minister. Uh, and you have uh, other members of the aristocratic clan uh, following that trend. And Divan Ramarao. Uh, who, who was uh, the one to um, uh, Sri Mulam Tirunal uh, later on constructed his residence on another hilltop. So, so the mm -hmm. trend was followed. And uh, what about the um, uh, structures in the in, within the fortified area? 
even now uh, are those uh, uh, as as you mentioned this uh, sections were made no we have the agraharans to one side are they still being maintained in the in the same manner okay actually the sectorization uh, done by uh, keshav and vishnu radhan nambudiri uh, uh, was uh, uh, actually uh, intact till uh, um, maybe till uh, 19 uh, early 19th century but uh, regarding agraharams um, as i mentioned when the capital was shifted and when martanda verma um, uh, reconstructed patmanabha swami temple lot of brahmins from uh, various places uh, in tamil nadu uh, shifted to tiruvananthapuram and they were all uh, welcomed here and these people uh, some of them were um, renowned scholars like if you go to um, uh, uh, the Rama Varmapuram Gramam, that is, that lies just outside the fort wall on the southern side. Uh, you have the family of the Ganapadigal. Uh, they were great scholars, Vedic scholars. So people like Ganapadi families, great scholars also came, and many poor Brahmins also came. But all these people were uh, uh, welcomed, and they were given uh, jobs in the temple or uh, in the palace. So they they. Uh, set of residents in Tiruvannandapuram and in and inside uh, the fort area or around fort area. So if you uh, look at the present heritage, uh, whereas in Agraharams you have houses sharing walls, and it is a very linear kind of typology. Uh, so uh, the design uh, and the orientation of, uh, of uh, these Agraharams, uh, uh, it was actually uh, very much associated with the temple. So if you go to Fort area and see uh, the pattern there, you have you, you can still see that Padmanabha Swami's uh, temple is the core and around the temple, along the processional routes, uh, on four sides of uh, uh, the temple, you have uh, Agraharams. So uh, Agraharams are still there, uh, but um, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, the heritage character is slowly transforming but uh, we do have hope because around 2005 um, uh, the fort area was designated as a heritage zone and now we have heritage guidelines and now if you want to do some kind of um, a renovation or a reconstruction or any construction activity inside uh, the heritage core and if you are working on a heritage structure then you need to follow the heritage guidelines but as a conservation architect how uh, you would know how feasible are these uh, guidelines how 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 can ordinary citizens is it possible for them to keep in mind these guidelines and continue to live in old and weak structures or uh, i mean is it it's a practical problem you know so how do they go about this that's a very difficult question to answer because uh, see uh, as i mentioned uh, these agraharams some of the agraharams are very old you have agraharams dating back to 200 years uh, and um, uh, some of the agraharams are new uh, relatively new constructed in 1930s and 40s but all these properties are uh, uh, private properties uh, so when you want to make, uh, when you want to impose some kind of heritage guidelines or uh, uh, rules, uh, it is very difficult, uh, uh, especially with uh, private properties, because first of all, you need to create an awareness amongst people. That is very important. And uh, that awareness creation part, unfortunately, in um, in mostly in India, we see that that section, uh, 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 that part is not uh, done properly. So probably if you want to enforce all these things on uh, uh, those properties, first you should go about with an awareness program. You should tell them about uh, the history of the place and the importance of these structures uh, they live in. And uh, in that way, you will uh, create a sense of pride uh, uh, in the honors, only with such a measure can we go about uh, saving uh, these structures in the fort area. 
I guess that's where uh, initiatives like the Heritage Walk to Vandrum becomes important, yes. where at least we can spread the awareness about it. But then I, I still feel, as a, a regular common citizen, it is still a very difficult thing for expecting people to, you know, continue to live in old and weak uh, structures and shell out money uh, from their own pockets, which is quite difficult sometimes to, you know, maintain the structure in the way it is. So that's when you end up having uh, people uh, do away with wood and timber and tiles and, you know, they go for modern construction. I think uh, there needs to be, uh, uh, I feel there are, there, there, there's various ways that government also can intervene and try to help in the maintenance of these uh, private properties you know, so that they are maintained as uh, heritage streets and heritage uh, uh, sections or sectors wherein, you know, uh, the common citizen also can uh, maintain uh, 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 the structures the way they are with some financial help from the government. Otherwise, it's too much of a burden, don't you think? Yes, 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 I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So even uh, recently when we were talking about how even public structures like uh, uh, churches and uh, mosques, etc., there's a big talk and debate on how old uh, churches and mosques are being demolished uh, with uh, on the request of the congregation themselves. You know, the people of the, uh, the church or the mosque won't uh it to be renovated in the latest trends with concrete and granite and stuff like that but that i think is something wherein um awareness and a little bit of uh, activism can help uh to you know uh, in, uh, for us to intervene and ensure that those structures these grand old structures are maintained and not yes. demolished for new ones isn't it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I agree with you completely, Pila. These, uh, yeah. these old structures have to be maintained and mm. conserved properly. And that's where the role of a conservationist like Sharad comes into picture. And even yours, Pila. Uh, your role <laughs> in maintaining interest in this invaluable history of Tenorandapura uh, is, uh, I mean, it's indescribable, honestly speaking. At this juncture, I would like to request all viewers present online to send in your queries into the comment box in whichever medium you're watching, whether it's YouTube or Facebook. Please send in your comments and uh, any questions you have. Um, Dr. Bina and Architect Sharath would be gladly willing to answer your questions. Uh, we have a question from Rajesh. Why the name Putan Street? Why is it built outside fort? What kind of status the residents occupied in the temple history? Uh, so Putan Street, I think, is the street uh, that's in front of um, uh, Sri Varaham Temple, which is uh, the very old uh, temple um, located on the southern side of Padmanabha Swami Temple, outside the fort area. Of course, Keshavan Vishnu Tratan uh, I think was not asked to include that temple inside the fort area. Uh, so so it is still there outside the fort. So Putan Street, if you look at the uh, Agraharam settlement, so Putan Street, you have Agraharams, that Gramam is known as Rama Varmapuram Gramam. You have uh, three or four streets uh, of uh, Agraharams there. You have Anavan Street, you have uh, First Putan Street, Second Putan Street, uh, and several other streets there. I don't remember all the names now. Uh, but uh, why is it named Putan Street? But uh, generally, people think that Putan means new, and that th those uh, those settlements there came up during the time of Mardanda Verma, that is when he constructed the fort and when the residents came, the Agraharams were constructed inside the fort area, there was not uh, there was not enough space inside the fort and therefore he had to construct uh, all these streets and Agraharams outside the fort. That's, that is the general story that we hear. But if you look at Madhulagam records, uh, in fact, you see that um, uh, there was a very old uh, Agraharam settlement uh, in that region and Putan Street uh, was actually uh, restructured and the old name we don't know. 
uh, because Anandapura Varnanam is a text from 14th century, uh, which mentions a, a, a Shiva temple in that uh, area. Uh, but uh, that temple's name we know as Agnishwara Shiva temple. That temple is still there, uh, but but we don't have any uh, uh, further details about the old name of uh, Putan Street. So probably the settlement there was restructured. It was only restructured during the time of Martha Navarma, and probably he expanded the old settlement there. Uh, and therefore. Uh, when something old was pulled down or replaced with a new construction, it came to be known as Putan Street. Uh, it was built outside the fort area. Yes, uh, it is outside the fort area. Uh, that is because uh, it is an old settlement and you have uh, a very interesting thing there. Because if you if you generally read about Agraharams, it is mentioned that on either side of Agraharams, you, sh you should have two temples. One temple dedicated to Shiva and one temple dedicated to Vishnu. The, the axis is only visible in Putan Street. That is, you have Agnishwara Shiva temple on the east, which is an insignificant temple today. It is very hard to find out the exact location of the temple, but it is still there. It is known as a Bhajana Madam temple or something like that today. Uh, but on the west, uh, west of that temple, to the west of that temple, you have uh, Varaha Murthy temple, uh, which is a temple dedicated to Varaha Murthy, that is Vishnu. So you have uh, a, a Vishnu temple and a Shiva temple on either side. So, so uh, the very idea of creating an Agraharam uh, holds good only there in uh, uh, in Putan Street. So uh, probably that is a very old settlement, and that is why Martha Varma and even the later rulers decided to maintain it like that. I think we have a few more questions coming. Yeah. yeah there you go. Uh, yes, uh, we have one question. Yeah. Uh, was there a major change in urban fabric of Trivandrum uh, by the British invasion? Um, uh, I, I think, think uh, we should first, uh, uh, it, it shouldn't be, it's not an invasion, you know? I mean, yes. I think it is wrong to use words like invasion um, it, 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 it's a phenomenon which happened as uh, the British uh, took more and more control over. It was a lot of uh, things changed in the urban fabric of not just Trivandrum, of the whole country and the entire subcontinent. There was a lot of changes that went through. So I think we already discussed about uh, structural changes that happened in Trivandrum because basically the uh, the settlement expanded beyond the fortified area. You start seeing uh, settlements coming up um, uh, well beyond the fortified area. That is what uh, in Trivandrum that we see uh, majorly. Uh, the major change in the urban fabric of Trivandrum. That is what we see settlement came up well beyond the fortified area. And of course, there were a lot of uh, cultural changes, trends, and uh, evolution of the society at large that happened. So uh, that is definitely a change which comes about uh, when you have uh, colonial powers uh, overseeing us. There's, those changes are definitely there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sharath, you could take this. Yeah, how the name Tirivitankur came up. Um, uh, so Tirivitankur, um, um, actually the old name of Tirivitankur was uh, Sri Vajum Kod, or uh, that, that was the uh, name. And uh, if I think if we uh, go on explaining uh, the details of how the name changed and all, uh, we, we would uh, probably need another session like this on this particular topic, uh, but uh, uh, simply it was uh, uh, Sri Vajum Koda and later on it got transformed to uh, Tirivedan Tor. You can definitely think of another session too. <laughs> Okay. There existed an architecture style from East Fort to Gabdiar Palace, but now some of the buildings have been demolished and new buildings are being constructed. Yes, yes, that is true. Uh, the colonial character 
uh, that uh, that uh, I think it is still very much visible in that stretch because we have all those grand constructions starting with uh, the secretariat, then VJT Hall, uh, the University College, uh, then the vernacular department of University College, uh, and um, uh, uh, what the public library and all those wonderful structures are still there but sadly uh, some of the uh, beautiful buildings uh, especially some of the old bungalows uh, were demolished we always have a problem with private uh, or, or privately owned buildings when it is a public building the government can undertake and uh, do uh, what needs to be done with uh, with in terms of uh, maintenance uh, preservation and you know but then private uh, privately owned bungalows unfortunately there's not much the government can do unless the structure itself has some historical significance beyond uh, just the architecture if it has some historical significance is when the government will uh, intervene and uh, try to preserve and protect it but otherwise privately owned bungalows it's very difficult to uh, insist that they be preserved yeah that's all with the respect to questions, I think. So thank you very much, Architect Sharad Sundar and Dr. Pina Tarakan for that very interesting and informative session on the intricacies of planning of Thiruvananthapuram Fort area. We'll be closing today's session now, but looking forward to meeting all of you for the Kerala Architecture Festival online edition tomorrow at 8 p.m. to discuss the cultural mosaic of Kerala with Mr. Bonnie Thomas and Mr. K.J. Sohan. Till then, good night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.